This is Al Black with Chewing the Gristle with my co-host, Tim Conroy. This is a poetry chat. And our guest this week is the Japanese poet, Miho Kinas. Miho Kinas is a 2019 Pushcart nominee. She's a Japanese poet and translator living in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina in the US since 2014. She is the author of two poetry collections, Today, Fish Only, in 2015, Math Paper Press, and Move Over Bird, 2019, Math Paper Press. Her current associations are with the Poetry Society of South Carolina and Island Writers Network. She teaches poetry classes at various locations throughout organizations such as the Pat Conroy Literary Center, the local school system, and lifelong learning and Bluffton Book Festival. Her books are available at www.bookzactuallyshop.com. That is B-O-O-K-S-A-C-T-U-A-L-L-Y shop.com. Um, with that, welcome to our friend and the poet, <laughs> Miho Kinas. Hi. Hi, Al. <laughs> Tim. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with you guys. Miho, tell us about your poetry journey and education and who were your early poetry influences. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, th there are so many beginnings that, you know, I write poetry, poems in English, which is my second language, which I, I acquired as an adult. I did not grow up speaking English, unfortunately. So there are so many beginnings. Um, but 20 years ago, I decided I, want to, I wanted to become a literary translator. So I decided to you know, kind of brush up on my English so that I can translate Japanese modern poems into English. So I went to this website called uh, writers.com and it's still going and I still go back there from time to time. It's a really great place to be. And I met wonderful teachers. First one, her name was Allegla Wong and she is a poet and writer, a great teacher. And she told me, uh, Miho, if you want to translate poems, you have to become a poet first. So that's how I st uh, started writing poems in English so that I can translate. And um, the second teacher I met was uh, Mark Olmsted. And he still teaches there and he's a great teacher and he's a great editor. Um, I do not write anything very long. I use very few words, but he can take some more words from my poem and make it even better. Or sometimes he switches his, uh, some words around, just, just switch them. And then, you know, poem is much better. It's just kind of amazing what he does. And um, well, I call him my muse. And every time I go to his class, something good happens. And uh, I was first, uh, published in 2009, that wouldn't have happened without Mark. So I owe him. <laughs> in 2012, I enrolled in MFA program at the City University of Hong Kong. This MFA program was perfect for me because the program was focused on Asia. So all the students and every faculty member was, had some kind of relationship with Asia. So we have our own certain issues, you know, trying to write about Asia for the people who know nothing about Asia. For example, how do we relate to outside readers and how do we keep our own 
I don't know, just our own style, our own knowledge, and we don't have to over explain. There, there are a lo lot of things to consider. So I had a very good two years in that, in that, you know, in a protected environment, I think. And there I also met um, great teachers, many actually, but if I mention just one, her name is Suzanne Paola. She teaches in Seattle area these days. She is a poet and she's a non-creative writer as well, a non-fiction non writer. And um, she told me one day, Miho, your prose is actually better than your poems. And then I understood what she meant by it. And probably stylistically speaking, um, after Mark, Mark who showed me how to write short and compact, um, Suzanne showed me mixing of prose, sort of. And she also introduced me to Anne Carson. Anne Carson is, I think she's Canadian, but she's a classicist. Her expertise in the um, Greek, you know, classic literature. And she translates them. And uh, she also writes poems and beautiful essays. Translators are, that's what I wanted to become, and I'm still, you know, working toward it, are kind of desperate people, you know, especially translating poems. It, that's kind of an impossible thing to do. So you have to be very inventive and resourceful to do it successfully. Not for everybody, but the, for some people, you know, they really understand what the translator is trying to do. So, um, Anne Carson, I think, is the first poet that really, you know, because I really like people like Elizabeth Bishop and Shemas Heaney, my favorite poets, and then, of course, Emily Dickinson. But I don't think Elizabeth Bishop's poems or Shemas Heaney's poems influence me, unfortunately. <laughs> it's just, I just love them. But Anne Carson, the, his, her styles, along with uh, Mary Jo Banks or David Young, they're all translators with a lot of creativity, a lot of imaginations in, in the forms of writing. So I think that's how I came <laughs> about. Yep. Mm -hmm. I know that you uh, teach workshops on haiku mm -hmm. and um, can you explain the difference between writing a haiku in Japanese mm -hmm. and writing a ha haiku in English and then maybe a little bit about the longer form that's tonka? Okay. Um, well, to me, writing haiku in Japanese and English are totally different things. But one thing is that I feel more free writing in English because you don't have all the baggage of, you know, haiku, the history and all the conventions, and you can change a lot of things. So uh, maybe that's why, though, I do write in English, you know, just I feel very light without following the conventions or anything, you know, it can be right. And then also Mark really taught me how to write short and what to say, what not to say. So that's, you know, you suggest things but you really don't tell anything. You don't explain things. And then it's up to the reader. So um, also, technically speaking, uh, the syllables. So Japanese haiku, I think I really think it needs to be five, seven, five syllables. Otherwise, it's just a short poem. So uh, there are some exceptions. So there are some modern haiku poets who wrote uh, like a sentence and has nothing to do with 575, but that's a great exception. And maybe if I can ever master the actual art of haiku, I might venture in that area. But otherwise, if I say I'm gonna write haiku in Japanese, I really strictly go to 575 syllables. However, in English, 
in one syllable, you can say so much more in English. Five, seven, five syllables, kind of long. So what I get from Japanese haiku, if I want to do the same thing in English, I can do it much shorter. So like three words, five words, four words, something like that. So it would be maybe three syllables, five syllables at most in the middle, and then another three syllables. So it's a little different. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Miho. I wanted to ask you about your collection, Move Over Bird. Mm -hmm. the, the prose poetry in that collection is really terrific and fascinating to me. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit about the prose uh, poems in that collection, especially the poems that um, kind of are, I think, 14-line poems? Oh, right, right. Okay. Um, yes, this one was uh, like a class assignment. It, yet another teacher, Barbara Henning at writers.com, she gives an excellent classes. And it was her um, assignment, sort of. I mean, she said, when you write something in a day, continuously, 14 hours a day, no matter what you write, they are somehow connected. So what you do, what I did was uh, wake up in the morning and first hour, one line, second hour, another line. You just keep doing it for 14 hours. Then, of course, you edit. <laughs> of course you edit and then I well it's kind of a analyzing yourself in a way what kind of day it was why I wrote this sentence this hour what happened you know it's just kind of um, yeah <laughs> but I think it's it's really fun whenever I talk about this a lot of people say that okay I'm gonna try it I haven't met anybody who actually tried yet, but <laughs> maybe someone's doing it. Well, if, if you would, why don't you read a few poems from Move Over Bird? Okay. So I think I'm going to start with End. Uh, it's in the, uh, the Move Over Bird. And this was the one that I really appreciated that was nominated for push card. Um, all right, End. In a random obituary, I hear of your death. No more rain, the balcony is still wet. You have been dead for eight months. A deep river flows between the years laid out side by side. You are always late. Red and goldfish hide under a rock, always late with your sleeves carefully folded. A cat knows the sunny spot. Flash lilies stick their heads out of the net. I haven't forgiven you for showing up with a comic book that day. Bright leaves don't see me in the interior darkness. A downstairs neighbor talks to me for the first time. The back door is ajar. Two mosquitoes are in. I try, but I cannot remember much else about you. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, well, this is not exactly done in the same way. Uh, let me see. Should I read another prose poem or something totally different? You choose. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this, my house. Uh, five years ago, I went to Arizona. It's, there was a writer's conference. I was still in the MFA program, and the day sent me there. And uh, for the first time, I saw um, uh, Grand Canyon. You know, that area, the scenery uh, in, the, in America, that's just, I had never seen anything like that. And I met uh, Navajo poets, and I really, really loved it. Um, I don't know, I felt very close to Native American poetry. So I borrowed some lines from 
this is a, a we don't know who wrote them but so i combined with my sentences and i wrote this poem called my house i am approaching the mountain the sun rises from the mountain on this cold morning my house is made of stone i am climbing the mountain the breeze checks on the leaves on a very spring morning my house is made of wood i am walking on the ridge all else is still on a quiet morning my house is made of paper i am descending the mountain now a bird on this hazy morning my house is made of pollen i am leaving the mountain i stand in this after the rain morning my house is made of light wonderful thank you do you have one more you'd like to share um okay um since i talked about mark <laughs> and uh, so i was published one of the three poems are published two were more prosy poem but there was one short one uh i might read two actually it's very short and then the other one is also uh is it is from uh, Uh, from my first book, actually. So I'm going to read two poems. One, on Buddhism. There is no future for Buddhism in Japan, our family monk declares. My mother slips another bill in the envelope. So whenever the family monk does a ceremony for our ancestors, uh, we do, of course, you know, pay him. There is no fixed price. We just put whatever we think is right in an envelope. So she added another bill <laughs> to the payment when he was exasperated. <laughs> another poem is called The Deliberation. This is, um, I wrote it when I lived in China. It's, uh, I used to go to market you know, near the house on the street. Deliberation. Women gather around a pile of potatoes. Elbowing the competition, they grab a potato, examine it through their glasses, above their glasses, weigh them on the train hands and put them back into the pile, shaking their heads and pick another and another as if finding a bride for the eldest son. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Potatoes as brides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a great image. So um, when you're writing and, re and revising, when do you mm -hmm. know your revisions are done? Oh, um, like never. <laughs> so when I run, run out of time, that's when it's done. Because when I read my poem often, you know, in public, I always read them differently. <laughs> I change words, I try to improve them, or I, I add something, or I slip in little translation. So, in a way, it's never done. Um, also, the way I write is like collage. It's, someone told me just the other day that my writing is like more sculpting than anything else. So, many poets, they have so many words, you know, outpouring um, you know, becomes a poem. And then they edit, 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 right? It happens to many people. Um, in my case, so I don't know, this is because I write in the second language. I don't have to this outpouring. But um, it, actually, even in Japanese, I tend to 
think more visually, it's more diagram. So like arrows and circles and things like that. And I have lots of fragments. I write all the time, but not like say you, Al, that you share your poems. You know, almost like daily, you can share something, you know, maybe a draft, but still something complete. Um, that hardly ever happens to me. I just have a, a seed of something or something just, just came. It could be really just a sentence, a few words, really diagrams or drawings or something. And then that just keeps on going. And then I'm doing a lot of re research, sort of collecting a lot of information. And then, you know, one morning I kind of wake up and decide I'm going to put this stuff together and they're everywhere. <laughs> I have, of course, a journals and notebooks and like, you know, piece of paper or, or like in the margin of books I'm reading. It's, it's a big mess and they're everywhere. But um, I know pretty much for say past two months what I had some, somewhat. So I collect everything and I tend to put it in word. And then sometimes I already have a short poem. Maybe, you know, I start from that. But other times, I, as I do the house cleaning, I assemble kind of, uh, yeah, like a live. <laughs> but then, of course, I keep editing, moving things. So it's like a whole collage, the entire book especially the second book is a collage. Then, um, so I decide to submit or, you know, complete the manuscript. So I have to have an imposed deadline, I, which I do it by myself. Okay, I'm gonna send it to you next week or something so that I'll finish. But then of course, editing continues. And even after, being, after the book is ready, I guess I'm still kind of, oh gosh, I should have done that. And then that changes every day. So in a sense, really, it never, I just keep messing with it. Mm. Yes. How has living in the American South impacted you as a poet? Mm. And who might you be reading at this time? Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, it's been kind of difficult. And uh, the first book is totally just me living in uh, actually China, but very close to Asia, I mean, I mean to Japan. So I, I have a lot of structured pieces and I think it's my native mode sort of. But the second book is, it, the content wise also it's half and half. And uh, I think um, I've lived in mega cities all my life, except for a short period of time in my 20s, like three months. And then also uh, since I came to Hilton Head, um, well, I wouldn't call this place country, not really, but it's not a big city either. And most of my poems used to be like eavesdropping, you know, people's conversation. In the cities, things happen. You know, Colombia, too. And also, I was in, in foreign cities like Hong Kong or Shanghai, which is foreign to me. So I'm always constantly guessing. So something interesting just happened to me. I just need to, you know, open up, stay there. But here, it's, you, don't, you know, if you don't go out really to specifically meet people, I really don't meet anybody. But I'm all of a sudden, I see so many birds, you know, oceans right here. So nature, uh, first time in my life, other than like, you know, um, maybe sparrows and pigeons and crows, we have, we have seen a bunch of those. But here I see like wading birds and uh, migratory birds. I'm learning so much. Um, the snakes come to see me, you know, it just all sorts of things, a stingray sting me and, you know, it's just, but I was having a hard time connecting all that to poetry. I love reading uh, nature writings, essays, like 
Lauren Isley is my favorite essayist and uh, or Stephen Jay Gould or uh, there are so many nature essays which I really love and I feel like you know I, I could lose myself just reading those however um, so-called nature poetry or pastoral the traditional say English nature poetry even people like uh, Mary Oliver which is very accessible, her poems are accessible, and I think they're really wonderful. But I felt some distance. I'm here, and this Western tradition of nature poems, pastoral or uh, echo poems these days, I felt like I never cross, you know, just going like this. And, uh, um, and I started reading uh, different kind of nature poems. Um, the anthology I'm reading actually right now is called The Black Nature. And it's subtitled as The Four Centuries of African American Nature Poetry. And I'm, I'm trying to read this very closely, but uh, basically I am so surprised that uh, the African-American poets, it's nature poetry, not the urban poetry. Well, <laughs> we can talk about a lot about this, but the nature poetry written by African-American poets are very different from, say, Anglo-Americans' traditional nature or echo poetry. It's just uh, even uh, what, the, what a tree means to them is very different. Of course, you know, there's individual difference that you know, nature could mean a very different things for each one of us. But for me being here, like say Asian, say like, say, okay, so basho, like nature, where, you know, looking at the nature sort of, and then there's a Western tradition. So I felt so, I don't know, it's, it's just foreign to me, and, which is true. So that's okay. But when I read these poems by black poets, it's not that I understand them but any better, but I felt this parallel line became more like a triangle. So that one day, this is a huge triangle, but I'm here and maybe Western tradition is here, but then, you know, these black nature poems are here. So I feel like I have a little bit more opportunity to actually write something in this environment because different ways of looking at things are possible. So, you know, I feel really, um, I don't know, I feel excited <laughs> about the possibility. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really fascinating. Thank you. I'd love to hear a few more poems, if we can, and maybe uh, uh, some from uh, today, Fish Only. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, in this collection, I have three sequences. So it's a collection of, you know, it's so many pages, just a collection of um, uh, small poems, sort of. And one is called uh, Going to Kyoto. It's a travelogue. So I visited uh, a few temples and shrines with my mother, and then I wrote a travelogue in Haibun style. And another one is called uh, On Food. It's uh, like a memoir in verse. So, well, it's actually Haibun too, the prose and poetry. So it's a memoir about food I grew up eating. And another one is called Excavation. This one, I don't know how to how to name this poem, <laughs> but it's like a mystery. Um, I have a setup and I have a six clues trying to solve the mystery. <laughs> so I, I am going to read the, the introduction, the setup, and the first clue as an, an example. Excavation. A small sheet of paper fell out when I opened the book of poems by Kotaro Takamura. It was an old Shinsei cigarette wrapper, a popular brand of the 1950s. 
turning the wrapper over, I find six titles and their page numbers. Is it my mother's writing or my father's? Usually my mother's writing is more fluid. My father is more dismissive because he writes without connecting characters. I realized I only know their recent handwritings. The first clue from Living Things, page 15. I didn't mean it. That's a childish thing to say. This line is a translation of a Japanese line. So I didn't mean it. That's a childish thing to say. No careless words were spoken in my house. My mother, ex-editor, was the word police. She pointed out every questionable use of language on TV and in anything written she came across, including my school teacher's notes. My father, a publisher, was quiet at home. Not much truth was told either. It is not always possible to find the right words. My father once said to me, you must try to understand your mother. Her boredom is rolled up into a sticky rice cake. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, Thank you. Miho, what advice can you give to the emerging poet about dealing with rejection? Oh, right. Um, well, of course, rejection, rejection of any kind is not very pleasant, but I don't know. It, I think acceptances should affect me more than rejections. The acceptances meaning, you know, editors of journals, publishers, and organizers like, you know, what you're doing, they are dedicated people. And, um, you know, I really appreciate when they they think their space you know i can occupy their space i really appreciate it and very grateful and then rejections i don't know i kind of get it because <laughs> not everyone likes what i do and you know what i do is not good enough for many people so so i think it's okay and um i always kind of feel i am just practicing poetry, like, you know, practice yoga, practice swimming. And I do go to a meet and compete. But the reason I swim every day is not because of that, because I want to win, I swim. No, it's just, I enjoy the process. So as long as I enjoy my process of writing poetry, um, you know, rejections are just, uh, I don't know, it just it happens. And also, uh, but having said that, publication has a big value to me because uh, my book is out there and my poems out there. So some people read them and some people contact me. That's how you met you guys. I, I met, you know, you guys too. That's just my way of saying, hey, I'm here. You know, this is what I like to do. Can we talk about writery things? <laughs> so that's my way of kind of a flagging. So, yeah, if it's only rejection, that really sucks. But, you know, something will eventually happen to anybody if you keep trying. So just do it. <laughs> What are you working on now, Miho? Do you have any um, projects in the well, work? Yes. Well, my fragments are accumulating, of course, day by day. Um, I also write when people ask me to do some reviews or uh, someone starting new journals, and I try to do it immediately. And also, I'm always doing, doing some research. I, I am working on uh, a little thing. But 
life as usual, corona or no corona, <laughs> this part of me does not change. <laughs> yep. Um, how do we get a hold of your books? Okay. Um, you mentioned booksactually.com. That is a bookstore, and my publisher is a publishing arm of that bookstore that's in Singapore. But however, if you are in the U.S., please contact the Book Lady Bookstore in Savannah. They have my copies. I've done some readings there. Um, they're a wonderful bookstore. Now they're back open. Um, 11 to 5, Monday through Friday, it's got limited hours, but you can find the Book Lady Bookstore in Savannah. If you call them or send a message, they will be happy to send my books to you. Yes. Wonderful. Well, we're coming to the end. Oh. <laughs> and we really want to thank you for, for talking with us and sharing, you know, your mm -hmm. journey with poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wonderful. So, th so thank you. Thank and you. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to hearing you read in person and mm -hmm. online. Um, and look forward actually to, to seeing you again um, when all of this uh, is over. Yes, Thank you. let's have a cup of coffee together. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.